Welcome back to Foundations of Earth Science. This is the Chapter 13 lecture from the 8th edition of the textbook. This chapter, The Atmosphere in Motion and Foundations of Earth Science, the 8th edition written by Lutkins and Tarbuck and brought to you by Pearson Education. So we continue our conversation about the weather. We're going to talk about pressure patterns and how pressure patterns create wind and then small scale circulations and also larger global scale circulations and how those larger global scale circulations actually end up creating the weather and the climate that we experience. So let's take a look at chapter 13, the atmosphere in motion. As we continue our multi-chapter look at weather, we're going to start now talking about air pressure and also how air pressure influences or actually how air pressure creates the wind that we experience and what that wind means to weather in general. So air pressure is the weight of air above your head. If you're standing at the surface, there's a column of air above your head. That column of air consists of air molecules. They may be nitrogen or oxygen, maybe even carbon dioxide or water vapor, but all those individual molecules have weight. And if you weigh them on a scale, they're going to have a certain total weight. And that total weight of air above your head is the air pressure. And we measure that, or we have an average air pressure generally around 14.7 pounds per square inch, or one kilogram per square centimeter. And that pounds per square inch, that PSI, 14.7, if you think about the last time you filled your tire with air, the air pressure of your tire was probably 30 or 40 pounds per square inch. So the air pressure in your tire is about twice the air pressure of the atmosphere outside. And that means if you have a hole in your tire, the pressure inside is higher, the pressure outside is lower, the pressure inside the tire is maybe 35 pounds per square inch, the pressure outside is 14.7. So the air wants to move from the higher pressure to the lower pressure and the air escapes from your tire. You know that you've seen that since you were a kid the first time that you got a hole in your bike tire, right? So air pressure and really all things in nature want to go from uh, areas of higher to lower gradient and air wants to go from areas of higher air pressure, atmospheric pressure, also known as barometric pressure, to lower barometric pressure. Now one thing about the atmospheric pressure is if you think about it, it will make sense as you go up in altitude, increasing altitude decreases the air pressure. So if you're standing at the surface by the ocean, the weight of the column of air above your head between where you're standing and the edge of space is 14.7 pounds per square inch. If you go halfway up to space and only half those molecules are above you, then it's going to be less. It's probably going to be somewhere around 7 pounds per square inch. So pressure always decreases with altitude. And let me just give you a sidebar to that. Because of gravity, most of the air molecules are pulled close to the surface. So the reality is, is air pressure decreases very, very rapidly with height, with higher altitudes having very low uh, air pressure. Now, we talked about pounds per square inch or kilograms per square centimeter. The other units of measurement that we use most typically with weather are millibars, and there's a time when we use inches of mercury in a barometer, but millibars. And millibars is just another way to say pounds or, or kilograms or whatever you know, unit of measurement we're using. It's a human construct. It's a millibar. Standard sea level pressure is about 1,013 millibars. Standard sea level pressure is about 1,013 millibars, about 14.7 pounds per square inch. Oftentimes in this class, if I'm talking about air pressure at the surface, I'll just round to 1,000 millibars because it's an easy number to divide by. So uh, here is that barometer and what you're looking at is is the tube, right? This is the tube and on the left are the inches of mercury that the air pressure is forcing mercury up that tube. So imagine this thin tube known as the capillary tube because it's so small is turned upside down into a pool of mercury. As the weight of the air pushes down in the pool of mercury, it pushes the mercury up the capillary tube. And so again, um, 29 2992 uh, inches of mercury, 1013.25 millibars. That's about standard atmospheric pressure. And this is a pretty good illustration of what I was referring to with gravity. Gravity pulls most of the air molecules closer to the surface. So at the surface, there's a lot of air molecules available. And as you go up in the atmosphere, there are fewer and fewer. The air literally becomes thinner. And we talk about that. If you're down here at uh, Satellite Beach training for your marathon, you have all the air that you can possibly have when you inhale. But if you go up 5,280 feet in altitude to the mile high city of Denver, we typically say that the air is thinner up there because the higher you go in altitude, 
the fewer air molecules there are because they are pulled toward the surface by gravity. There's your standard barometer. Again, there's your pool of mercury and your, your vacuum capillary tube uh, invented in 1643. And, and truly, this is a case of necessity being the mother of invention. People who own ships use those ships in the 15 and 1600s to go other places and get stuff, mostly spices, and bring those spices back to sell where they were, and they made a fortune doing that. So every time they lost a ship at sea to bad weather, they lost money. And so they had the need, the necessity, to figure out how to know when bad weather was coming. And the barometer was created to do that. As the barometer falls, our lower pressure approaches, you can have foul weather or poor weather. And as the barometer increases, as high pressure approaches, then you're going to have fair weather. So a falling barometer is bad and a rising barometer is good. And again, here you have fair weather when you have um, barometric pressure of 1,013 or higher, and then rain and foul weather when you have barometric pressure that is, that is lower. And this is sort of a, uh, um, you know, a different type of barometer, but instead of using um, a capillary tube, it uses that vacuum chamber. But the bottom line is, is when the pressure increases, the needle goes up above 29.92, and as you have high pressure, you have fair weather, and as the pressure drops in the atmosphere, as there are low, fewer air molecules above your head, um, and air tends to rise, then you will have foul weather. So high pressure, air is sinking, fair weather, low pressure, air is rising, foul weather. That's a very important concept to understand. So I talked about pressure gradients, and a pressure gradient is anything, or a gradient is anything in nature where you're going from a higher level to a lower level. Imagine you're on a skateboard and you're at the top of a hill, that's higher altitude, and the valley is at the bottom of the hill, that's lower altitude. That is a gradient from where you are at the top where you will be going at the bottom. And because of that gradient, gravity will pull you downhill. It'll pull you down the gradient. Well, air molecules work in the same way. If on this western side, a couple hundred kilometers away, you have high pressure, 1,016, maybe 1,017 millibars, and over here you have lower pressure, 996 millibars. This is high pressure. This is low pressure. The pressure gradient is from high to low. Now, the strength of that pressure gradient is the difference between the two pressure, 1,016, 1,012, so there's four millibars of, of uh, pressure difference over this space, which looks like it might be 150 kilometers. If you take the same change in pressure from 1,000 millibars at 996, so again, this is a four millibar change, this is a four millibar change, but here it's over a much, much shorter distance, then your gradient is, is, is tighter and your, your pressure gradient force is higher. So wind is the horizontal movement of air. Wind moves, or air, creating wind, moves out of areas of high pressure and into low pressure. The pressure gradient force, the PGF, the pressure gradient force is what causes the wind to blow, and that is a function of the difference in pressure, 1,016 to 1,012, 4 millibars, divided by the distance. And again, in this case, maybe it's 150 uh, kilometers. That's a fairly low pressure gradient and weak winds. But down here where you have a four millibar difference over a much, much, much shorter distance, you have the same number four divided by a shorter distance, you have a much higher pressure gradient. So um, pressure gradient is very low near high pressure and you have very, very light winds. And when you get closer to uh, low pressure, uh, then you have very high winds. And I just want to make sure I said that right. Uh, air pressure where the pressure is high, your pressure gradient force tends to be lower and you have weak winds. And where your pressure is low, your pressure gradient force tends to be higher and you have strong winds. And this is what that looks like on a weather map. Here over coming out of Canada, big dome of uh, cold high pressure, 1,036 millibar high pressure, which is pretty high, but you can get them into about 1,050. On any given normal surface weather map, you may regularly see pressure anywhere between 950 and 1,050. 1,000, you start getting below 1,000, that's a pretty deep area of low pressure. You get above 1030, that's a pretty high area of high pressure. 1036 to 996. So the pressure gradient is from high to low, but you see the winds aren't blowing straight from high to low, and that is the Coriolis effect, and I believe we've mentioned that before. The Coriolis effect, which causes winds to be deflected to the right, so clockwise out of high pressure, um, in the northern hemisphere. Now, because the pressure gradient becomes so much stronger close to the low pressure, here 
the Coriolis is greater than the pressure gradient, so winds turn to the right, and as you get closer to low pressure, the Coriolis is less than the pressure gradient, and the winds come in counterclockwise and to the left. And so, from high to low pressure, the pressure gradient is straight from high to low pressure. But Coriolis, around high pressure, the pressure gradient is weaker, and Coriolis causes wind to be deflected to the right as they move outward. And so around high pressure, winds move outward and clockwise, all right, all around the high pressure. And near the low pressure, the pressure gradient is stronger than Coriolis, and it, pull, and it pulls those same winds in, and they move inward and counterclockwise, inward and counterclockwise, and inward and counterclockwise. And something else that's very important in this situation is to recognize that where the pressure gradient is the tightest, where there is less space between the isobars, and again, the isobars represent lines of equal pressure. When we look at the previous slide, this is a line where everywhere along that line, the pressure is 1,016 millibars. This is a line where everywhere along that line, the pressure is 1,012 millibars. This is a line where everywhere along that line, the pressure is 1,008 millibars. These are also isobars, and so where the isobars are tightly packed, Typically, you have a four millibar difference between isobars, 996, 1,000, 1,004, 1,008, 1,012, where there's much less difference in distance between the isobars, so it's a four millibar change over the short distance, you have a stronger pressure gradient force and a stronger wind. One flag is 50 to 55 to 60 miles per hour, it's by 55 knots. One flag and a little half a bar is somewhere between 61 and 66 miles per hour. So this deep area of low pressure is generating a north wind somewhere around 55 knots or 60 to 65 miles per hour because the pressure gradient is so tight. Here the winds are moving away at about 20 miles per hour and as they get closer and closer to the low they wrap counterclockwise and inward and they speed up. And again you can see where the pressure gradient is tighter you will have, here you have a tight pressure gradient, here you have a fairly weak pressure gradient and where the pressure gradient is tighter you're going to have those faster winds. So we mentioned the Coriolis force. Here's another conversation about the Coriolis force. The Coriolis force is the apparent deflection in wind direction due to the Earth's rotation. In the northern hemisphere, it's directed to the right. In the southern hemisphere, it's directed to the left. Um, and so again, if you're at the North Pole and you're going south, the Earth is spinning underneath you. And so as something moves to the south, the Earth spins underneath it, and it appears as though it's being deflected to the right. And while this is the simplest um, illustration to show graphically, this happens in all directions. If you're in the northern hemisphere, whether you're going south, north, east, west, you're going to see an apparent deflection to the right. So the factors affecting the horizontal movement of air, or wind, will be the pressure gradient force, and in the case of this upper blue plane, high pressure to the south, low pressure to the north, the pressure gradient force is from high to low. These thin gray lines represent our contour lines, the, uh, the difference between high pressure and low pressure, and the pressure gradient force is from high pressure to low, the Coriolis force is to the right of the wind flow. So Coriolis pulls the wind to the right of the wind flow, and Coriolis increases for wind speeds. So in the upper levels of the atmosphere, above the level of frictional influence, your pressure gradient force is from high to low at right angles of the contour lines. Your Coriolis force pulls the wind to the right, perpendicular to the actual wind flow, until the pressure gradient force and the Coriolis force come into equilibrium, causing those winds to blow essentially parallel to the contour lines in the upper levels. At the surface, those contour lines are representing surface pressure in millibars, and they're called isobars. Aloft, above the level of frictional influence, which is 3,000 feet or higher, these lines represent the height above the surface. At the surface, those lines represent atmospheric pressure at, or isobars. And again, the pressure gradient is the same, so the pressure gradient force, the red arrow, is from high to low, all right? The wind blows and the Coriolis is perpendicular to the, to the wind flow, but because the frictional surface causes the wind to be slower, the Coriolis force is also slower. 
right? So this vector is shorter than this vector up here. So up here, the pressure gradient force and the Coriolis force are in equilibrium, equilibrium and the wind blows parallel to the contour lines in this direction. Here, the pressure gradient force is greater than the Coriolis force, so the wind doesn't blow parallel to the isobars. It blows across the isobars out of high pressure and into low pressure, and effectively clockwise out of high pressure and then counterclockwise into low pressure. And this is what it looks like in the upper levels. This is above the level of frictional surface. So this is not a surface weather chart, but down here you can see it's an upper level weather chart. And what you are looking at is your contour lines are the height above the surface. And this is in meters, 5,790 meters where it's higher, 5,190 meters, 5,130 where it's lower. This is an area of low pressure in the upper levels, an area of low pressure in the upper levels. Actually, this whole thing is a trough of low pressure in the upper levels. This whole thing is a ridge of high pressure in the upper levels. And the wind barbs, you can see, pointing in this direction, they flow parallel to those contour lines. And the speed of those wind barbs, just like at the surface when we're showing you, is a function of how tight that pressure gradient is. Here the pressure gradient is tighter. In addition to the pressure gradient being tighter, you can see where the wind wants to go from high pressure to low pressure, but it's deflected to the right by Coriolis. The pressure gradient is from high pressure to low pressure, and it's deflected to the right by Coriolis. And effectively, the winds blow parallel to those contour lines. All through this, they, over the ridge and through the trough, parallel to the contour lines, clockwise through a ridge of high pressure, which is known as an anticyclone, and counterclockwise through a trough of low pressure, which is a cyclone. The cyclone is the low, that's your cyclonic flow, counterclockwise. And so what we see happening here is an anticyclonic flow around high pressure, a cyclonic flow around low pressure. Now this little illustration here at the bottom essentially shows you what that pressure area is. There's a ridge where the, the air is higher, this is the trough where the air is lower, the heights are higher, the heights are lower, but in the end, in the upper levels of the atmosphere, our winds are going to blow parallel to the contour lines, anticyclonically or clockwise around high pressure, and cyclonically or counterclockwise around low pressure. So an anticyclone is the center of high pressure. Pressure increases toward the center. A cyclone, a center of low pressure, pressure decreases toward the center. And again, what that looks like, if we have our high here, right, here's our high, and we have our low here, okay, our, our wind is going to blow outward and clockwise around high pressure. Our wind's flowing outward and clockwise around high pressure, and inward and counterclockwise around low pressure. And so whether it's a loft or at the surface, that's what you're going to see. You're going to see clockwise flow around high pressure, counterclockwise flow around, around low pressure. And at the a loft, it's going to, the winds are going to flow parallel to the contour lines. At the surface, the winds are looking, literally going to blow across the isobars out of high pressure and into low pressure. Out of high pressure and then into low pressure. And again, this is what it looks like at the surface, essentially what I just drew. Wind moving out of high pressure in an anticyclone into low pressure in a cyclone. And they're calling this a mid-latitude cyclone because it's in the mid-latitudes. If it wasn't in the mid-latitudes, it'd be down here in the tropics, then it'd be a tropical cyclone. And of course, a tropical cyclone is going to be such as a hurricane or a tropical storm. So here's your surface weather map with your isobars in and around 1,000 millibar range. There's a low of 992. A high is up around 1,016, maybe a little bit higher than that. An anticyclonic flow out of high pressure clockwise into a cyclonic flow into low pressure counterclockwise. And the two are connected, meaning the flow aloft and the flow at the surface is connected. When winds blow clockwise out of high pressure, around high pressure, and counterclockwise into low pressure, at the surface the air is diverging, meaning it's moving away from the center. It's moving away from the center, and so since the air is moving away from the center, you create a vacuum at the center of high pressure. That air mass has to be replaced, and it's replaced from above. Okay, it's replaced from above. You can't pull the air out of the ground, you pull it in from above, and air sinks, and air sinks anticyclonically down, strikes the surface, and moves outward and clockwise. In the case of low pressure at the surface, the winds are converging at the center. They're diverging at a high pressure, converging into low pressure, and because they're converging, all this mass, all this air mass is piling up, and air rises, all right? 
But when you get aloft, that air that rises gets to the to the basically the top of the atmosphere and it diverges aloft and then converges aloft over high pressure. So over surface high pressure, you're going to have convergence, which forces air down. Over surface low pressure, you're going to have divergence, which pulls air up. And the other subtlety in this diagram is with, with air sinking here, it heats up and its relative humidity drops, and any water uh, droplets dry out and evaporate, and you have clear skies. Whereas where air is rising, as warm, humid air rises, it cools until it condenses into cloud droplets and you get clouds. So high pressure at the surface is sinking air and fair skies, and low pressure at the surface is rising air and cloudy or foul weather. So that is the circulation around areas of high pressure and low pressure, but we can also use global areas of high pressure and low pressure to get an idea of the global circulation of the atmosphere. And ultimately, all energy on Earth uh, from external processes is going to be provided by the sun. And so the general circulation of the atmosphere, just like uh, all other processes, are caused by the sun. In this case, it's unequal surface heating. And what does unequal surface heating mean? mean it, well, it means that at the equator, you're hot, right? At the equator, you're going to be hot. If this is the Earth, and there's the equator, remember the Earth's tilting on the axis, and the sun's out here, and the direct rays of the sun come in, they're more direct near the equator, so the equator's hot, and the direct rays of the sun come in at a much lower angle down near the poles, and so the, the poles are cold. Cold here and hot here, all right? Well, hot air rises and cold air sinks. Hot air is less dense and rises and cold air sinks. So the ultra-simplified global circulation is hot air would rise, move toward the poles and sink. And air at the poles would sink and move toward the equator. And that would be one big gigantic hemispheric convection cell in, the, in a very, very simplified version of the atmosphere. In reality, it's quite a bit more complex than that. And that's what creates the general circulation of the atmosphere. Instead of one big convection cell, there are actually three in each hemisphere. So there's actually a total of six. So in that idealized global circulation, there is an equatorial low pressure zone of rising air because, again, the equator is warm, so the air rises. As air rises, it cools until air water vapor condenses into clouds. And so at that equatorial low pressure zone all around the equator, you have a lot of cloud cover and abundant precipitation, and that is known as the intertropical convergence zone because it's an area of low pressure at the surface, Air converges on the equatorial zone, it's in the tropics, and it goes within the tropics, and so it's the intertropical convergence zone where air rises. That air rises and moves to the north, and there it begins to sink, and it sinks at about 30 degrees north and south latitude, and that sinking air, if you remember, rising air here creates clouds, but sinking air creates clear skies. So at that 30 north and 30 south latitude, the sinking air creates this subtropical high pressure zone, in which you have dry, stable, clear skies, all right? Then the air traveling from that 30 degree north latitude back south to the equator creates the trade winds, and the air traveling from that 30 degrees north latitude back to the, toward the pole creates our, our westerlies. And this is what this looks like. This is a two different models. This right here is that idealized model of the atmosphere that I drew for you. I'm gonna draw it again in which at the surface where the direct rays of the sun strike, in the equatorial zone, the air is warm because it's the equator, warm air rises, okay, warm air rises because it's less dense. At the poles, cold air sinks because it's more dense. At the, at the equator, that warm air rises because it's warm and it travels north, all right? As it travels north, of course, it cools and eventually gets to the poles and it sinks that air that sinks at the pole. So this is an area of low pressure at the equator, belt 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 of low pressure at the equator. At the poles, it is a center of high pressure. Remember, what does air do at high pressure at the surface? It, it diverges, it moves out, and it moves south. And that would be your single convection cell, up at the equator, north in the upper levels, down at the poles, and then south. You're single, that's your simplified circulation of the atmosphere. But that's not actually how it works. 
how it actually works in the global circulation. And this is largely because the Earth is spinning. There's Coriolis imparted, all right, Coriolis effect. So at the equator, that equatorial low, that is our intercontinental, or I should say our intertropical convergence zone, okay, our intertropical convergence zone. Warm air rises, okay, it moves north and cools. It sinks at 30 degrees north latitude, all right? Where it sinks, that's high pressure at the surface. It diverges, it moves to the south, and it moves to the north. Where it moves to the south, it creates the northeast trade winds, and down here in the southern hemisphere, it moves to the left because of Coriolis, and creates the southeast trade winds. And those winds are also converging, and so convergence of the surface also creates low pressure because the air converges, it piles up, and it's forced to rise. Here the air sinks, and as it sinks, it warms and lowers the relative humidity. Water droplets and clouds evaporate and dry out, and you have clear skies and very little precipitation at 30 degrees north latitude. And at 30 degrees north latitude and at 30 degrees south latitude, that's where the great deserts are, all right? At the, at the poles, the air is cold, and it sinks. So it sinks here, and it sinks at the south pole as well. As it sinks and moves south, Coriolis turns it to the right, which means where the westerlies come in and the polar easterlies come in, there's also a line of convergence. And that line of convergence also creates an uplift, and that is the subpolar low. So you effectively have three cells. Two of them are thermally driven, hot air rising, cool air sinking, cool air sinking, and then rising. And so the polar cell and our Hadley's our Hadley cell, and I don't know that this is, is um, identified as a Hadley cell, but that's what it's called. They're thermally driven cells, and then this cell in the middle is sort of mechanically driven. You have uplift at 60 degrees north latitude, sinking air at the poles, sinking air at 30 degrees north and south latitude, and rising air at the equator. And the rising air at the equator creates our, our band of very uh, cloudy wet weather, and the rising air at about 60 degrees north latitude creates a band of wet weather there. Think about it. Where is the Amazon? The Amazon's right, right here. Where is the, where's the, uh, the Congo? The Congo's right here takes rainforest to create those two massive rivers. Even the Nile, which is in a deserted area, its headwaters are down here closer to the equator. What does that look like in the real world? Well, I have two examples, January and July, so wintertime and summertime. And I'll start at the top in our January. And again, at the equator, even in January, it's, it's warm. It's pretty much the same temperature year round. And where the sun strikes directly at the equator and the equator is warm, air rises, and as air rises, of course, it creates an area of low pressure. Warmth here at the equator causes air to rise. As air rises, it cools by expansion until the temperature reaches the dew point. When the temperature reaches the dew point, condensation begins and cloud formation occurs. And at the equator, you have cloudy and oftentimes rainy conditions. And that's what creates the Amazon River Basin, the Congo River Basin, the very, very wet areas in Indonesia and Polynesia, all right? So air rises. When it gets to the top of the, the first layer of the atmosphere, the troposphere, it gets up to that tropopause, all right? When it gets up there, it runs in the tropopause and it begins to move north and begin to cool. And as it cools, it begins to become heavier and more dense and it sinks, and it sinks. Oh, let's see if I can find a blue one. And there's a blue one. And up here at about 30 degrees north latitude, it sinks. And why does it sink? It sinks because it's cooler and it's heavier. And sinking air tends to create clear skies. And sinking air at 30 degrees north and 30 degrees south latitude creates these belts of deserted areas. The major deserts of the world are in that belt at 30 degrees north and 30 degrees south latitude. Yes, southeastern Florida is not deserted because again, it's got ocean and Gulf of Mexico on either side, but the southwestern desert, um, the, the deserts of the Sahara, uh, the deserts of Arabia, uh, the deserts in Asia, and even at 30 degrees south latitude, you have deserted areas in South America, the deserted areas of South Africa, and of course the Great Desert of Australia. And so at, at, at the equator, air rises and creates rainy conditions, and then at 30 degrees north and south latitude, air sinks and creates drier conditions. At the poles, air sinks, okay, and at the poles, air sinks, and that causes the air to move to the, um, uh, to the south, all right? So here the air moves to the south, and as it's moving from north to south, it also begins to turn to the right. So it's, I know it looks like it's going to the left, but imagine it as you're from the poles facing south, 
it turns to the, the right. Uh, and that turn to the right causes it to run into the air coming up from this high pressure at the south. So at 30 degrees north latitude, there's high pressure. High pressure is clockwise and outward. Clockwise and outward, right? So the air is moving clockwise and outward. That creates an area of northeast trade winds. But north of it, it's clockwise and outward creating these westerlies. Clockwise and outward creating these westerlies. And where those northeast, or those polar trade winds, those polar easterlies, and the westerlies meet, you get a different area of low pressure at about 60 degrees north latitude. Let's see if I can find my red. There it is. At about 60 degrees north latitude, you get another belt of, of low pressure. And that's where you also have stormy conditions at the, at the subpolar front. And so you have a belt of low pressure at the equator, belt of high pressure at 30 degrees, belt of low pressure at 60 degrees, and then high pressure again at the poles. And again, the results, as you can see, around our high pressure, our subtropical high, we have clockwise in the southern hemisphere, counterclockwise, creating the north, northeast trade winds and southeast trade winds, converging air in the ITCZ creates, forces air to rise. The westerlies are created by the subpolar high, the easterlies are created by the polar high, they converge to create this subpolar low. And the effect on the weather, again, creates a rainy area at the equator and a rainy area at 50 to 60 degrees north latitude, and in between is your deserted area. Those are the global wind circulations. There are also regional wind circulations like the monsoon in East Asia, which the, books talks about, the book talks about, and then local winds, much smaller scale winds, that are generally just like the global winds. Remember, global winds are a function of differential heating. The Earth is it's hot at the equator and cold at the poles. Well, our local winds are also created by temperature differences. They just create smaller scale winds, and those smaller scale winds are a combination of land and sea breezes, mountain and valley breezes, and essentially what we refer to as downslope winds. Uh, and downslope winds have a couple different names, but uh, there's a Chinook wind and there's a Santa Ana that we're going to talk about specifically in this book. But uh, for those of you in the Florida area, this is a very something very specific that we see. Uh, you're going to have to imagine we're on the Gulf Coast here, not the Atlantic Coast. But land and sea breezes are created from temperature differences. And if it's June at the Gulf Coast, let's say over in St. Petersburg, the Gulf of Mexico may be uh, 72 degrees in the morning. Let's, let's go with May or maybe even April. 72 degrees in the morning, and the land may be 72 degrees in the morning. There's no temperature difference. As the day wears on, the land gets hotter faster. Land gets hotter faster than water, right? The beach is blazing hot by midday, but the water is basically still the same temperature. So over water, there's cool air, and over land, there's warm air. That warm air rises over land. The cool air sinks over water. This creates high pressure, sinking air. It's a little small-scale high. Air diverges out of high pressure, converges into low pressure, and that creates the sea breeze. The sea breeze is the cool air coming off the water during the heat of the day. The result of the sea breeze circulation is that the cool air sinks over the ocean, moves inland over the land, and that inland moving air, again, converges into low pressure. Air rises, as we know, when air rises, it cools by expansion until its temperature reaches the dew point. When the temperature reaches the dew point, it's 100% relative humidity or saturated. Further lifting creates condensation and cloud formation. And so along the incoming sea breeze, you typically get a line of clouds, and maybe even if it's hot enough and moist enough, a line of thunderstorms. And in central Florida, our typical summertime afternoon thunderstorms are a function of the sea breeze setting up in the afternoon and those clouds moving inland. This is coming in off the Gulf of Mexico, but on the other side, they're coming in off the Atlantic, and where the sea breeze is from the west coast and the sea breeze is from the east coast collide, that's a whole other area of convergence creating uplift, and that's where those typical afternoon thunderstorms come from. Now, at nighttime, the opposite occurs. So at nighttime, the water remains the same temperature, but the land may cool off cooler than the water, creating high pressure cool air sinking and then moving offshore where warm air rises offshore. And sometimes if you go to the beach in the morning, you'll stand there on the beach, it's a beautiful clear morning, and just a couple of miles offshore there's a line of clouds. Well, that line of clouds has often been developed by that offshore land breeze. So the sea breeze is an onshore flow and the land breeze is an offshore flow. And for surfers in central Florida or really anywhere, we have good clean waves in the morning. They typically get choppy by the late morning and early afternoon because that sea breeze sets up and winds begin blowing on shore.
Two other types of thermally driven local wind patterns are mountain and valley breezes. And essentially, uh, the controls of temperature tell us that at the surface where there's lots of air and lots of air molecules, there's plenty of uh, molecules that scatter the sunlight as it comes in, that the surface at the low levels, those temperatures don't heat up or cool off as quickly as they do in the upper levels up on the mountainside where there's actually fewer air molecules. Fewer air molecules means more of that sun strikes the mountainside and heats it up. So it may not get as hot up high in the mountain, but it warms up more quickly, causing the air to rise off the mountainside and the air to cool down in the valley, the air to be cool in the valley and sink. And the sinking air in the valley and the rising air in the mountainside creates what is known as a valley breeze. And of course, along those mountaintops, as that air rises, again, rising air cools by expansion, until the temperature reaches the dew point, which is 100% relative humidity, further lifting creates condensation and cloud formation. At nighttime, again, at higher elevations, air heats up and cools off more quickly. In the case of nighttime, the Earth is radiating away its heat, but there are fewer air molecules to hold and trap that heat, so that heat radiates away more easily. Rapid cooling at higher elevations on mountainsides causes cooler air to flow downhill and it, that gives you the mountain breeze, where air converges in the valley and rises there. And sometimes you get clouds down in the valley at night, like you see in the Smoky Mountains. Chinook winds and Santa Ana winds are essentially winds that are forced down slope. And because those winds are forced down slope, let's just say this is our mountainside, because those winds are forced down slope, as those winds go down, remember, that pressure increases in the atmosphere. If this is sea level, pressure is 1,000 millibars down at sea level. That's average surface pressure, right? But the pressure may only be 900 millibars up here at the top of this mountain. And so as air is forced down slope, the pressure increases. And when pressure goes up, if you recall, temperature goes up. So as air is forced down slope, increasing pressure causes it to warm up. If the air warms up, then the relative humidity goes down. Any cloud part, any uh, water droplets or, or cloud droplets that may exist evaporate in, in skies clear and the air warms up. So a downslope wind is oftentimes a, a warm wind. So Chinook winds, and the word Chinook literally means snow eater in the Rockies when warm, dry winds move down the east slopes of, of the Rockies. Any snow that might be developed out here between, let's say, Denver in the mountains or Boulder in the mountains, that warm, dry air literally causes that snow to not just melt, but evaporate. Now, the opposite happens uh, like sort of on the other side of the Rockies where you have uh, the high levels. So this is, uh, this is the California coastline. So here's the Pacific Ocean, the California coastline, and it goes up very high, uh, just in, like, so, let's say, the Nevada area. You have a large... Um, plateau, the Colorado plateau is nice and high, and air sinks from high pressure there and sinks down slope, and the same thing happens as it goes down slope toward the beaches of California, that compressional heating heats it up, and you get a hot, dry wind known as the Santa Ana winds, and those are regional uh, wind flows that are created, in this case, from down slope. The, the down slope motion of air causes that air to actually heat up. There are those Santa Ana winds coming in from southern Nevada, coming in out the higher basin and range area, and as they get forced downhill to the Santa Ana Gap, they get focused and they get heated up, and there's a very hot, dry wind that gets forced downhill. Uh, how do we measure the wind? We measure the wind in direction and in speed. And wind direction, the way it's labeled, is the direction from which the wind originated from. So a north wind is coming from the north, and a south wind is coming from the south. Winds are labeled from where they originate, north winds blow from the north. Prevailing winds mean, of course, that winds are blowing generally from one direction. The prevailing wind in Florida is from the east and southeast. That's our prevailing wind. The other basic measurement of winds is wind speed, and wind speed is measured with an anemometer. That's what measures wind speed. Uh, and uh, anemometers are just those little things that you see spinning in the wind um, on weather vanes, and that measures the wind speed. So what causes a change in wind direction? Well, it goes back to the same conversation that we've had many, many times before, 
in the upper levels of the atmosphere where winds converge, when they come together in the upper levels of the atmosphere, right at the tropopause, the top of the troposphere, where they converge, they can't go up to the tropopause, they can't do that, so they go down. And where you have convergence in the upper levels, you get sinking air. Sinking air creates high pressure, clear skies, and air at the surface moves clockwise and outward. Clockwise and outward, clockwise and outward. The opposite, as we know, occurs where you have convergence at the surface. As those winds move outward from high pressure, they move counterclockwise and inward into low pressure, counterclockwise and inward into low pressure, counterclockwise and inward into low pressure. That's convergence of the surface, forcing that air to rise. And when that air gets up to the tropopause, it can't go through the tropopause, right? So it diverges away, it diverges away and converges uh, over high pressure. So you have divergence aloft over low pressure, convergence, this is convergence aloft over high pressure. And again, as air is forced to rise, it cools by expansion until its temperature reaches its dew point right here. Where its temperature reaches its dew point, we say it's 100% relative humidity or saturated. The air is saturated and further lifting creates condensation and cloud formation. And over low pressure at the surface, you get condensation and cloud formation. So how does this affect winds? Well, if you are standing right here, the winds are coming toward you from the east and southeast. As this low pressure moves by from west to east, once that low pressure moves by, those winds turn from south and east to west and northwest. The same thing happens uh, if, you're, if you're over right here and your high pressure is moving along from west to east. The winds were from the north initially, but as that high pressure moves by you, they turn from the south and southeast. So as passing cyclones and anticyclones move along, they change the wind direction, but they also change temperature and moisture conditions because a south and southeast wind is going to bring warm and oftentimes moist air in, so higher humidity air, where a north and northwest wind is going to bring drier air. So passing anticyclones effectively will give you um, changes in wind direction that also end up creating changes in moisture conditions. And this is what that looks like at the surface. This is our surface weather map again, with our high pressure and our low pressure, what we don't have here is the fronts that are associated with this. So out ahead of a low pressure system, because the air is coming from the south, you're going to have the leading edge of warm and oftentimes moist air. That is this south flow right here, south flow, southeast flow, southwest flow. And if that flow is coming off the Atlantic and the Gulf of Mexico, that is going to be warm and moist. Whereas right along this trough in the isobars, that's our cold front, because our cold front is the leading edge of cold air. Here's our north wind flow, right? Our north-northwest wind flow, north-northwest wind flow, north-northwest wind flow. So what kind of air masses are those two wind flows bringing? Well, again, this south-southeast and south-southwest flow is going to bring warm and moist air. This north-northwest is going to bring cool and dry air. So if you're here in Tennessee, as this traveling cyclone, and this is known as a mid-latitude cyclone or an extratropical cyclone, sometimes a middle-latitude cyclone, as that middle-latitude cyclone goes by, at first you're here in this warm, moist flow here in eastern Tennessee. Warm, moist, muggy. As that cold front approaches, it's going to lift that warm, moist air, very likely give you a line of showers and thunderstorms. And then behind that cold front, now you have to imagine this has all moved off over here. Now our low has moved off to here. This feature has moved off to here. You're in the same spot right here. Now you have a north northwest wind flow, and that brings cool and dry air into your area. So traveling anticyclones are going to create warm, moist air. Check that. So traveling cyclones are going to bring warm, moist air out ahead of them and cool, dry air in behind them. Traveling anticyclones are going to bring cool, dry air in ahead of them, but behind them, you're going to start to see warm, moist air. Warm, moist air is you start to get a, a, uh, a, a clockwise and outward flow. Counterclockwise and inward, counterclockwise and inward, clockwise and outward, clockwise and outward. 
As the low approaches, warm and moist. As the low passes, cool and dry. As the high approaches, cool and dry. And as the high leaves, it goes back to being warm and moist. So then it all gets wrapped or tied together by looking at the global wind patterns, that subtropical high creating an area of dry weather, that equatorial low, our inner tropical convergence zone creating a belt of moist weather, our polar high obviously creating cold and dry weather, our subpolar low, that belt between the polar high and the subtropical high that creates an area of, of uplift in rainy weather, those large-scale global features create regions of dryness and, and high humidity or precipitation. So the regions are influenced by high pressure, low pressure, and regions that are influenced by high pressure typically experience relatively dry conditions. Regions influenced by low pressure typically receive lots of tropical precipitation. So the tropical regions at the equatorial low are very rainy, and the subtropical regions at subtropical high tend to be very arid. Looking at either our January or July map, we can see that where the air rises at the equator, because the air is warm, you have the opportunity for clouds and rain. Where the air rises, you have opportunity for clouds and rain. Where the air, so as your air is rising here, at the equatorial regions. Where air sinks at the subtropical high or at the polar high, where it sinks, you can have drier air in this belt, drier air in deserted areas, and drier air up the poles. And high as, as air leaves high pressure and creates a westerly wind, leaves high pressure and creates a northeasterly wind, and air sinks at the low pressure, creating an easterly wind, the westerlies and the easterlies, they converge right along this belt and that creates a belt of low pressure in which you have uplift again and clouds and precipitation. So where you have high pressure, you get dry conditions, and low pressure, you get precipitation. Now there are other factors influencing precipitation. Uh, warm air is gonna have way more moisture. Cold air is gonna have almost no moisture in it. In it. Of course, the latitude depends on your, helps you know, ter determine your temperature. Low latitudes are gonna be warmer. High latitudes are gonna be colder. And also, continents and oceans, the distribution of continents and oceans have a lot to do with how rain uh, and, uh, and temperature works. So this is a, kind of an idea of the global distribution of, of precipitation. And it's pretty easy to see that here at the equator, this is the line of the equator, that is where all the moisture is. 20 to 30 degrees north and south of the equator, 15 to 25 degrees north and south of the equator. That is your band of equatorial low and moisture. Then, just north of that, 25 to 35, now you start getting into your subtropical highs and you get your band of very, very dry. Here's your dry to the south, your dry to the south, and your very dry of Australia to the south. Way up north, yeah, you have sinking air, uh, but, and you, but and you have almost no, um, uh, no moisture at all. So you have sinking air, no moisture up north, you get very little precipitation at the North Pole and the South Pole. Yes, you think of the South Pole as being frozen and covered in the glacier, but it's not because it snows all the time. It's because wherever snow does fall, it never melts. And then your other area where we have ample, ample precipitation is that area just around 50 to 60 degrees north latitude where the polar easterlies and the westerlies converge, creating a belt of convergence right across 50 to 60 degrees north and south latitude. And that belt of convergence creates an area where we have precipitation. And that's where our mid-latitude cyclones come from. That, that front, that, that subpolar front creates our mid-latitude cyclones that sweep down across the continent of the United States and bring our cold and uh, cold, cold fronts and also bring our precipitation. That is going to wrap up Chapter 13 from Foundations of Earth Science, the 8th edition, the chapter of the atmosphere in motion. Of course, this is brought to you by Pearson Education um, and written by Lutkins and Tarbuck. I'm your instructor, Dave Cacciarella, and we'll be continuing uh, with the weather as we move into Chapter 14.